Needs no introduction. Good morning, Carl. I'm wondering if you have any idea about our new affiliate, uh, KYLS News Talk 94.3 in Fredericktown, Missouri. Got any intel on Fredericktown, Missouri? I sure do. Madison County, a good Republican county, and on the eastern edge of the lead belt of Missouri. My dad, who was a hard rock geologist, actually did some geological work in uh, in the area. In fact, uh, ironically enough, it uh, the lead mines of uh, that part of Missouri helped bring about his early and lucrative retirement. You know, Rove, one day you or Barone is going to trip up when I throw something at you, and then I'm going to be surprised. But let's get to the map. You should talk the most on this. Let's start with the House. How do you feel about the Republican chances of getting the House? What do you think the margin will be when we shut it down on election night in November? Well, look, I've, I've long thought that it, not only are we going to take the House, but ironically enough that it would be sort of an average midterm election. If you look at it since World War II, the average, if you take out 2002, where, where the Republicans actually gain seats um, while holding the White House, the party out of power gains about 28 seats. And I thought it's going to be you know, sort of in that range, because in 2020, something weird happened. We lose the White House, but we pick up seats in the U.S. House. That's why we started this uh, legislative session 28 Democrats, 218 Democrats, 213 Republicans. So only five, five seats, excuse me, 222 Democrats, 213 Republicans, only five down. Of a switch of five would have given us the majority. And, and so my point is that we started in a strong position. So if we gain, if we gain 28 seats, which may be the upper range, uh, that would put us at 241 seats, which is 10 seats more than Newt Gingrich had when he was uh, sworn in as speaker in January of 1995. So, um, you know, I think it's going to be in that range. Maybe it, as time goes on, a little, it's a little bit fewer. Uh, could be a little bit more if conditions break our way, but I think it's going to be about in that range. All right, let me play for you uh, a familiar sound effect brought to my attention by Tom Trattop, who is Salem's uh, go-to guru on talk radio. Can we play that, the Arby's bit? Arby's, we have the meat. So, Carl Rove, last week Tom pointed out to me that the We Have the Meats ad, where two or three of their sandwiches went from $6 to $7. He calls it the Arby's Misery Index. What do you think? Is inflation still the leading indicator for this race? Yeah, look, look there, there, are two, there are two different sets of issues. There are the issues that the ordinary American voter is feeling uh, around the, the, you know, at home, around their kitchen table. Uh, she's either going to the grocery store and finding it's a lot more expensive or – uh, she's finding out that at the, at, uh, at work, uh, her paycheck is not keeping up with the rate of inflation. Uh, but that's that's one set of issues, and those those set of issues are the are inflation and the economy and concerns about crime and concerns about the border. There's another set of issues though that are the sort of the media elite, and that is all you know that is the right to privacy and the right to unlimited abortion. And the right to, you know, the, the right to contraception. And all of a sudden, these issues are the issues that are being, you know, talked about by the by the media. But they're not, I think, the things that are going to determine the outcome of the election. The outcome of the election is going to be largely determined by the things that people are feeling around the kitchen table and at work. So statewide elections will usually tease out the former over the latter. Let's run down the map, Carl Road. There are four holds that the Republicans need, Wisconsin, North Carolina, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. What do you think of each of those? Well, I feel, I'm feeling pretty good about Wisconsin. It's going to be a tough race right to the end because it's a battleground state that's settled by you know several, several tens of thousands of votes. I think Ron Johnson is running a good campaign, and his opponent, if he takes one step to the left, is going to fall off the edge of the earth, which is why Mandela Barnes is attempting to, to – he won't say the word progressive, and he is running as fast and as furious away from his previous positions as he can get. But there's plenty of that, whether it's you know defunding the police or uh, you know abolishing private health insurance. There are lots of crazy things that he has said over the years, and Johnson is going to have a wonderful opportunity to, do, to, to make the use of those. I'm impressed with how Ted Budd is uniting the Republican Party in North Carolina. Um, I, I, th- I think he's going to be all right. Uh, J.D. Vance has had a rocky start, but the state is red. And as long as lots of people are in there spending money, I'm involved in a group that's spending you know, several tens of millions of dollars in the American Crossroads Senate Leadership Fund. And I think at the end of the day, he'll be all right. And then Pennsylvania, which... 
you know, control of the U.S. Senate could come down to uh, who wins that race. If the Republicans hold Pennsylvania with Mehmet Oz, they stand a very good chance of taking the Senate. Now, Dr. Oz is getting better. He's been on this show once. He's coming back. And I was impressed. He was on with Brett Baer last night, and I was impressed. And John Fetterman is hurt. And I have sympathy for him and prayers for him, but I don't know if you can win incapacitated. Carl, does that happen? Well, it occasionally happens, but you have to be enormously popular or politically very uh, adroit. And, uh, you know, he, he he started out ahead, but I think people are looking at him and saying, is, is he up to the job? Is he up to the task? But in a way, it's sort of like, you know, hiding a, a, another weakness, which is, again, much like Mandela Barnes, here's a guy with extreme views. I mean, he literally, you know, said, uh, you know, the, referring to another state official, I mean, he said, he, he, this other state official opined that you could let a third of the people out of uh, Pennsylvania state prisons uh, without affecting public safety. And um, Fetterman said, I agree with that. And I, I think it's very profound. And I mean, again, once again, this guy is very, very much to the left of the Democratic Party in his state. And, uh, and yet he won the nomination. And uh, uh, Oz has him, Dr. Oz has a great opportunity to draw some distinctions there. Uh, last time Ron Johnson was on, I said that I thought Fetterman was the most uh, left-wing Senate candidate I've ever seen, and he argued with me that Mandela Barnes is actually to the left of Fetterman. I don't think we have to decide that so much as point it out that it's a race yeah, to exactly, the left. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Let me go to the you know, takeaways. One other thing about Wisconsin, one yes. quick thing about Wisconsin, I think Ron Johnson's having fun. If you look oh, at yes. the pictures this summer, uh, you know, he has been, he, you know, Wisconsin, they have lots of pr- local parades and festivals and you know, uh, and and there he was having a fun time out there campaigning, and that's what you need is a, a happy warrior, and he appears to be a very happy warrior this time. He is. Let's go through the five takeaways. I'll do them alphabetically. If the Republicans win any of these, I think Mitch uh, McConnell will be the leader again. Arizona, Colorado, Georgia, New Hampshire, Washington. Let's start with Arizona. Blake Masters against incumbent Mark Kelly. Well, first let, let's start with one you left out, Nevada. Oh, you're yeah. right. My gosh, how can I forget Adam? Oh my, that's a given. Well, I don't think it's a given, but he's running a very good campaign, and uh, you know he's a good, he's a friend of mine, and as I suspect, he's a friend of yours. I yes. think he's a wonderful human being, and a great life story, and a wonderful uh, state attorney general, and I think he's going to win, which is our best shot for a pickup. That's why I forget it, because I, you know, when you have to add something to your pickup list, that's good dag. You're right, Nevada. He is going to win. Now to Arizona. Yep. Uh, tough contest. Got to unite the party. Uh, Took some very strong, um, uh, hard views during the primary. It's a state with a lot of a uh, lot of Republicans, but it's got a lot of independents, and uh, this is going to be a tough race. And my hope is that Peter Thiel continues to to support uh, Blake Masters, his former chief of staff and close friend, because there's not enough money to go around for all these races. The surprise of the cycle is in Colorado with Joe O'Day, Carl Rove, and I can't have him on enough. I like him so much. He's such a normal guy. Well, I, I, but full disclosure, a week ago Monday, I did a fundraiser for him in Denver, took time out of my family vacation to go join him. I was blown away. First of all, he share, he and I share something in common. We're both adopted. And uh, what a wonderful guy. I mean, yeah. I just there was so there's so much authenticity, the directness. Here's a guy adopted by a Denver cop and his and his stay at home mom uh, gets into trouble when he's a teenager. Uh, his father says, OK, we're going to send you to the Catholic uh, school, got a partial scholarship, and you're going to work Saturdays and Sundays to pay the rest of your tuition. Turns his the Monsignors, turn his life around, uh, graduates, goes to a carpenter's union apprenticeship program, becomes a union carpenter, works a, as a carpenter for four years, falls in falls head over heels in love with an attractive Latina, follows her to Colorado State University. They work their way through school, get married, work their way through school. He graduates it with a construction uh, management degree from Colorado State. The two of them start a construction company, and it's the, it, it now is a large company that does most of the water projects in that part of the world. And he's a wonderful human being. And you look at him, you listen to him, you look him in the eye, and, and you just sense that this guy has enormous integrity, tells you what he thinks, humble. I was just completely blown away, and I, I think you're right. This is a very interesting contest. And the fact that the Democrats spent $10 million to try and defeat him in the Republican primary says that they know something about his ability to get garner votes. 
All right, Georgia and New Hampshire. we got about two minutes and three races. I'm very high on Herschel's improving ability to talk and talk to people you know, directly as one guy to one uh, voter. What do you think about Herschel? Yeah, look, it, it, the, the, he has an enormous strength, which is that there's an enormous reservoir of goodwill. And you're right, yes. he's, he, he's not been a political candidate. He's been a pro, a pro football player and a role model. Somebody who's talked about the challenges that he faced in his own life and how he found the courage to ask for help. I think he's an inspiring figure, and you're right. He's getting better as a candidate, and his opponent is a left winger. I mean, Raphael Warnick would be right at home representing the state of Massachusetts or, you know, Vermont. I mean, it's like, you know, he'd be a good California congressman from the Bay Area. I mean, so, yeah, I, I, this is going to be a barn burner, very expensive, and going to go right down to the end. And, and uh, fortunately, Herschel's on the ballot with, with uh, Brian Kemp, who's going to, I think help him by making it. There are not going to be a lot of people who vote for Brian Kemp and then vote for Raphael Warnick. Now, I cover New Hampshire from the top out of Portland to Manchester and Keene in the south. Great affiliates all the way around. New Hampshire has to nominate Chuck Morris and then he can win. I don't think anybody else can beat Maggie Hassan. I'm a realist. Do you agree with me, Carl Rowe? I totally agree with you. And, and please, would you start saying the name of the state correctly? New Hampshire. New Hampshire. You got <laughs> no, I... you you a little <laughs> d- 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 tone there. New Hampshire. Absolutely. Chuck Morris has been a great ally in passing Governor Chris Sununu's um, package. He's a good conservative uh, with sensible views. He, he can beat Maggie Hassan, and you're right. He's the only one who can, who can put it together in a general election. And, and again, the Democrats are spending, Chuck Schumer is trying to nominate a guy named Balduck by spending uh, about uh, 7 or $8 million here in the last two weeks of the campaign in this little state in the Northeast. So wow. it's a sign of the desperation of the Democrats that, that they want to stop Chuck Morris. Okay, last 30 seconds, Tiffany Smiley, all the way across the country in Washington State. Oh, my, please, thank God my wife is not in the room. We, we, we saw Tiffany Smiley speak, and my wife just was blown away with, with the, her life story, with her charisma, with her thoughtfulness. Uh, she's a terrific candidate uh, in a tough state, as you know, but it's, uh, she is an unbelievable. Um, it, it's funny, two of our best candidates are in t- two of the toughest states, Colorado and Washington State, but she's terrific. Uh, Carl Rove, keep coming back. It's always good to check in with him. Follow him on Twitter. Watch him on Fox News. I'm joined by United States Senator Tom Tillis of the Tar Heel State. Good morning, Senator. How are you? I'm good, Hugh. I hope you are. I am. I want to begin with uh, a sort of indication of what's going on in real America. A friend of ours, Tom Trata, he's a senior executive with Salem, sent me the news that the advertisements for Arby's have changed. We know that we have the meat ads have been out there for a long time. Well, that wonderful voice used to display the gyro and the beef and cheddar and fish sandwich and a pounding drum and yelled, two of these for just six bucks, we have the meat. This last week, that new commercial, same sandwiches, two of these for just seven bucks. The misery index has become the Arby's index, Senator Tillis. Is inflation still on the minds of voters? It absolutely is, and I think it will be on the minds of the voters on Election Day. The the Democrats are doing everything they can to deflect attention away from the failure of this administration on the economy. And our, our focus is to make sure that people understand they're still paying way too much for gas, way too much for food, and they're just barely making ends meet. Leader McConnell brought the caucus together yesterday. According to Playbook, everybody agrees that they're on the same team and we got to win the vulnerabilities are in Ohio and Pennsylvania. I'm not very worried about J.D. Vance holding that seat at all. It's a red state. Tim Ryan's a friend of mine. I don't trash Tim, but it's a red state. Uh, Dr. Oz has a, a uphill battle, but John Fetterman, he's not in good shape, Tom. Tell us, what's it look like to you? I, I think we're in great shape. I think we've got great candidates that are that are working hard. I had a reporter as I was leaving the Capitol yesterday say, you know, what do you make of this discussion of the fundraising gap and uh, behind in the polls and uh, candidates not organized? I said, well, I can, I can think of 2014, 2020. There was this candidate running. They said he's, he's never been closer than two points. He, he doesn't seem to be running across the state. Um, and he's got a two-to-one disadvantage on money. I said, oh, wait, that was me, second-term senator. It always is that narrative. The election effectively started on in, on Labor Day. You know that, too. Our candidates are running hard. Resources will be there, and I do believe that the Republican base is motivated. That's why we're going to take the House, and that's why we've got a good shot at taking a majority in the Senate. 
I want to talk about takeaways. I think Herschel is doing very well. He's been on this show a couple of times. I interviewed him in person down in Atlanta last year. People like Herschel. He is not going to give you, it's not going to roll off his tongue, the latest statistics on GDP and, and making or anything like that. He's just, he's likable and people trust him and they want a Republican check on this president. I'm also very confident about Joe O'Day. That's the surprise of this year. Maybe Tiffany Smiley is number two. But just right there, those are three takeaways that the Democrats are worried about. Well, first, I told Herschel the only thing I don't like about him is how badly he beat up my Tennessee volunteers back in the day. Um, he's running a good race. He's getting out there. He's hitting the ground and talking to people. And, and I think that the people like him. I think O'Day, I met with him several months ago, have supported him. Successful business guy, came from nothing. And um, as employing hundreds of people, he's got the right message and he's the perfect candidate for Colorado. And the reason I know that is Chuck Schumer spent millions of dollars trying to prevent him from winning that primary out there. That's the best, the leading indicator of who they're afraid of. In New Hampshire, they're trying to keep Chuck Morse out of the general. Now, Chuck Morse, I've endorsed him. I know that you may not endorse in a primary, but Chuck Morse can beat your colleague Maggie Hass, and I don't think anybody else can. And you're right. When Democrats are spending, go the other way, Senator. And this is, this is actually unprecedented how much they've spent to nominate candidates who can't win in the general. Harry Reid spent millions of dollars trying to defeat me in a primary. He did the same thing with my buddy Dan Sullivan up in Alaska. So that's why we know we've got good candidates in those states and the incumbents are nervous. Lisa Murkowski is going to win easily in Alaska. That brings me down to Arizona. I believe Arizona could shift at the last minute. It's, no state has been more impacted by the border, Senator Tillis, and no state has kind of the veteran population. I don't know what it is per capita. North Carolina is pretty high per capita in veterans. So is Arizona. But they remember Afghanistan. You and I were last together at the uh, premiere of the rough cut of the movie about the last days of Afghanistan. That's still got a wrinkle in Arizona. It, it absolutely has to. As a matter of fact, we just uh, observed the first year, I can't say celebrate, but observed the first year anniversary of, the, uh, of our work in getting people out of Afghanistan in those horrible days last year. People need to understand that that was a strategic and tactical failure, and there are still thousands of people in Afghanistan that deserve to get out of that country. And, and they also have to recognize that Biden's decision um, has destabilized the Middle East and created a breeding ground for terrorists who are thinking about how they can plot against U.S. interests abroad and here at home. So let me go back to politics for a moment, because the two races that the Democrats don't talk anymore about your colleague, Ron Johnson, and your future colleague, Ted Budd. And let's take them in that order, because you know Ron very well, and you know Ted Budd very well. And Ted Budd is running for the first time in North Carolina, so I want to finish there. But I think uh, Ron John is going to just do fine up in Wisconsin. I don't even think it could be a seven, eight point win by him. I think Ron does a great job. He he connects to the base. Uh, he, you know, everybody had him left for dead in the last cycle. He knows how to win. He works hard. Nobody works harder than him in an election cycle. I believe that he wins at the end of the day. And I think Ted Budd, just uh, between internal polls that I've seen, uh, with the money, it's what the Democrats should be worried about, with the huge money differential there, Act Blue pumping millions of dollars in a Beasley's campaign, one of the most liberal candidates I've seen run for the Senate in my time in politics. Uh, it's about Ted continuing to pound on the message that it's about the economy, it's about gas prices, it's about failures of this administration and foreign policy, and that's why he wins. Ted Budd knows what he's doing in Congress. That's why you won. You knew what you were doing when you came to Congress out of the state legislature. My son's in-laws are in Winston-Salem, and Aaron and Russ are smart. They, they see Bud. I mean, they know he's running. I don't know what this talk about the other guy. I honestly couldn't have named him until you mentioned Beasley. I don't know anything about him. He has not made an impression on the national scene. I don't know what Act Blue is doing, but they often spend a lot of money stupidly. Uh, how does Bud feel about I know he's running through the tape, but how does he feel about it? Um, I, I think he feels good. Ted and I were together last week. Uh, we did a, a roundtable with sheriffs and border patrol on the, the crisis at the border. Uh, he is just uh, well put together. He's a serious legislator. He's going to be a great member of the conference. He's a successful businessman and a friend of mine for 
almost 10 years. So I've got a lot of confidence in Ted running through the tape, and I'm going to do everything I can to help him in the meantime. And working on our state Supreme Court, which has one of the most liberal overreaches of anything we've seen in North Carolina history over the last two years. Uh, Same thing happened in Pennsylvania and same thing happened in Ohio and voters react against that. Let me close, Senator, by talking about Chris Licht and CNN. I don't know if you're one of the Republicans he sat down with and begged to start showing up on CNN again. Were you? Did you sit down with Chris Licht? (laughs) No. (laughs) Okay. Well, he went around. He tried to get a bunch. I I hope he succeeds. We need more than one trusted news network in the United States. But I don't know why anyone would go on CNN right now. I think uh, the I, you know, I'd be happy to go on CNN uh, if I get to sit at the table and I can't be cut off through a satellite feed or a, a Zoom feed because they need to be taken to task for some of their policies and some of their or for some of their false narratives. And I think that we sometimes have to to step up and uh, and take them on. They want to have me come in there and uh, and try and surprise me. We'll just see how it works out. But if they haven't had invited me yet. Um, I generally go to about any interview that uh, somebody asked me to. And we've got to speak truth to the people who watch that network and let them know that it all is not what it seems. Well, it's the airports of America are tuned in. But the, but the problem is what you just articulated, an edited interview. John Fetterman sat down with an old uh, radio colleague of mine, Stephanie Rule. I used to work for NBC and MSNBC. It was done the day before and they edited it and she gave him the answers in the question. He still couldn't give it. It's 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 a home field advantage. People know I'm a Republican. I declare it. I don't like it when people don't declare it. Well, I think you're right. And, and I just think that we um, we have to continue to fight the false narratives that are out there, the false narratives on student loan debt being a good strategy. It's inherently unfair. It's creating another entitlement program. The fact that gas prices are going down, but they're still over two times what they were when I was driving to Washington when we had COVID shut down. I was paying a dollar thirty eight a gallon at exit 104 on uh, I-95 coming into uh, – uh, coming into Washington now, everybody's high fiving because we're at 340 or 350. And and let, let's also keep in mind the strategic petroleum reserves are at their lowest point since 1984. Biden used his political crisis to draw down our petroleum reserves, and it's just one of several examples of where they're just creating astroturf and we and and making people think the grass is green, but it's artificial and it's not sustainable. That is a great reminder. Senator Tom Tillis, always welcome here on the Hugh Hewitt Shows. Thank you, Senator Tillis. I'll be right back, America. Gallagher represents Wisconsin in the United States House of Representatives on the Intel Committee. He's also on Armed Services. He is a new dad a second time over. Good morning, Congressman. You getting any sleep? Uh, Not much, Hugh. Uh, Not much at all. So that's the best way. That's the best thing about being a new dad. And I'm glad I'm a grandpa, not a dad. Congressman, I got to read to you the breaking news from John Breach, CBS football writer. As he picks this week's games, quote, the only difference between now, this year, and then last year is that we know there are psychedelic drugs in South America that can help you win MVP. Thanks to Aaron Rodgers for that knowledge. You can judge Rodgers all you want for taking ayahuasca, but I'm not going to judge him for going to a South American drug bender. But that's mainly because I've done some of my best work after doing weirder things in South America. Rodgers might have reached a higher level of spiritual consciousness this offseason, but I do not think he'll be reaching the highest level in the NFL, a.k.a. I will not be picking his team to win the Super Bowl this year. In fact, in the first week, they've got the Vikings beating the Packers down in Minneapolis, Congressman. That's a trip. Liberal liberal media bias, Hugh. I mean, the concern is uh, Lazard, I guess, our, our top receiver, didn't practice. He's got some sort of injury. So I'm trying to assess how severe that give is. Give him some psycho. Give him some of that stuff. But look, look at, okay, so look at the disparity here. So Aaron Rodgers goes and takes ayahuasca, wins the, the MVP two years in a row. By the way, ayahuasca not banned by, by the NFL, totally within the NFL's rules. But then the fact that he didn't get the vaccine makes him a total pariah. It just goes to show you how screwed up the NFL's COVID protocols war, are. And, well, that's uh, true. Aaron, Aaron Rodgers has reached demigod status, so he can do no wrong, in my opinion. He's the greatest quarterback in the league today, and that will be true when he wins the— uh, Have you ever heard of a guy named Brady? Never heard of him. No, that old guy? Okay, that's that, – yeah, that old guy. All right, so let's get to the serious stuff. And the serious stuff has to do with the JCPOA 2.0. I cannot believe— we are still at the table with these people, Congressman. You're on Intel and Armed Services. Would you? Pe- I got a new affiliate in Missouri. They don't know you from Adam. 
Uh, you're on Intel and Armed Services. You're a Marine. You're a PhD. You know what you're talking about. Why is this a bad idea? Well, I don't know. I, I have a huge following in Missouri. Uh, I'm really big out there. So shout out to everybody <laughs> in Missouri. Um, but uh, I can't, there's a few issues. Out Wait there. a minute. You just you just put a challenge out there. I want you to tell me where Fredericktown, Missouri is. Do you know where oh, Fredericktown, I, Missouri is? Yeah, it's about 30 miles south of uh, Johnsonville, uh, I think. Uh, yeah, good answer. Yeah. Good I don't try. Know yeah. 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 Um, Okay, so a few issues at play. When when Biden campaigned, he promised that he would get a deal that was longer and stronger than the original JCPOA. And remember, one of the many problems with the original JCPOA is that it was filled with sunset provisions. So some of the biggest constraints in the deal, such as they existed, expire. We've actually already blown past some of the sunset provisions and the remaining most meaningful ones, sunset at the end of this decade. So by all accounts, we've done nothing to make those sunsets disappear, make the provisions permanent, and there's nothing in the new JCPOA that's gonna address the fact that any constraints on Iran's program simply evaporate in a matter of years. So obviously, if you're Iran, the best thing you would do, the smartest thing you would do is just abide by the terms of this weak deal until it expires, and then you can crank up your nuclear program to an industrial grade capacity. So that's point one. We are not going to get a longer or stronger deal. We're going to get a shorter or weaker deal. Well, now there's this new issue. If you remember, due to some heroic action on the part of Israeli intelligence, allegedly, we now know that the Iranians, as anyone with, a, with common sense could have told you, the Iranians had a nuclear weapons component to their nuclear program. The IAEA, the Nuclear Monitoring Organization, has an ongoing investigation into that very fact. But apparently one of the things the Iranians are demanding in order to sign this new, weaker Iran deal is for the IAEA to completely close the books on that investigation. So we're never going to get an understanding of how far the what's called PMD, the possible military dimensions of their program, have gone. And if you don't have that understanding, if you don't have that baseline understanding of how far they've gotten, how can you develop an inspections and verification regime that allows you to monitor any deal going you forward? You can't. Exactly. The third and final thing I mentioned, though, there's many aspects of this deal we can get into. I think it's fair to say maybe the biggest political mistake uh, former President Barack Obama made is because he knew this deal was so weak, he never submitted it to Congress for ratification uh, as a treaty. I mean, it was an international agreement, a major international agreement, and he did it purely as an executive agreement or an agreement between himself and the supreme leader of Iran. And therefore, it did not survive his tenure in office. President Trump came in and he ripped up the deal. Similarly, President, President Biden is not just going to repeat uh, President Obama's mistake. He's going to go a step further. And what we're hearing is they're going to insert a provision into the deal whereby if a future Congress or a future president abrogates the agreement, the Iranians will be allowed to snap back to massive advanced nuclear uh, production. So you're basically in an unconstitutional fashion. I haven't heard that before. A future. Yeah, I, I have not heard that. That's wild. Totally wild. Totally wild. And again, if you if you honestly believe that this deal is good for international security and advances America's interests, well, then submit it to Congress. And oh, by the way, and this is the final thing I'd say here. One thing exists now that didn't exist when President, o President Obama started negotiating with Iran, and that's something called the Iran Nuclear Agreement Review Act, which means that if there is a new deal, the president has to submit that agreement to Congress, not for ratification as a treaty, but for an up or down vote of disapproval. Apparently, they're going to argue that because this is still within the old JCPOA framework, even though they're changing a lot of things, they don't have to comply with existing law. And that, of course, would be... Yeah, Congressman, I want to cover two things. One, what you just described is unconstitutional. You cannot bind a future Congress. All right, number two, this is a cult. It's a religion. The JCPOA, when I went, you may have been at the one time I went to the Aspen Institute. I don't go anymore because it's completely gone over the left edge. It was like going to a wake for the JCPOA. And it, it still is that way, but now it's become a cult. And they are cultish in their devotion. There is a picture in the Times of Israel this morning of uh, Prime Minister Lapid 
standing in front of an F-35 saying to Iran, don't tempt us. And you know what will tempt Israel to strike will be this. This is a war-inducing agreement, as you've just described it, because Israel will feel like Joe Biden does not have their back. I totally agree with that. And, you know, last night I was privileged to join the Nixon seminar to talk about the Abraham Accords and everything that went into that remarkable accomplishment. And the fact is, and what makes this even more maddening, is we now have, for the first time in a long time, in a region that I've spent most of my adult life dealing with that that's frustrated uh, our policy ambitions. Let's be honest. The Middle East is a difficult place to deal with. We now have, because of the Abraham Accords, a framework we can build off of. We have a recipe for stability in that region and building off that growing cooperation between Israel and the Sunni Arab Gulf states, because they have a shared interest in countering Iran, is the path to geopolitical success in the Middle East. And if this administration jumps back into the arms of the mullahs uh, so that John Kerry or whoever now uh, can get a, uh, you know, a, a Nobel Peace Prize, they will screw up the foundation of the Abraham Accords. It will create more chaos in the Middle East. And then we'll, we'll, we'll be uh, uh, returning to the problem that we've had in multiple administrations, which is where we want to spend more time focusing on the Indo-Pacific, but we get sucked into a cauldron of chaos in the Middle East because we misunderstand the basic alliance structure. And add on to that the fact it completely undermines this position's Russia policy. They promised to isolate Putin as a pariah. We're negotiating through the Russians in Geneva because the Iranians refused to negotiate with us directly. And the Iranians are selling drones to support Putin's war in Ukraine. Putin wants to sell arms to the Iranians over the long term. So you're basically going to solidify this anti-American alliance of the Russians, the Iranians, and the Chinese, who, by the way, just signed and a the North economic agreement with the Iranians and undermine our alliance structure in the process. It makes no sense. There's another story this morning that Putin is buying uh, millions of shells from North Korea. They are the, the junior partner in the four-way new uh, uh, axis. Let me go back to just a moment to the, the cult-like attraction of this. Did it come up last night that the Iranians are engaged in active plots to kill Americans on American soil? We know the target list. You know the target list. I know the target list. I don't discuss them other than the John Bolton indictment, which is public. But they are actively involved in trying to kill Americans, not just Donald Trump. How can we deal with these people? It doesn't that just loom up as a, a, a space odyssey 2001 kind of block of reality to hit the administration over the head? Not, not just deal with them, not just negotiate with them, Hugh, but potentially give them tens of billions of dollars to finance their terrorist supporting architecture uh, and regime. I mean, their, their proxies have grown more aggressive uh, throughout the Middle East. And if you remember the entire theory of the case that Obama came in with when he pursued the Iran deal was that it was going to create what he called a new equilibrium in the Middle East. Basically, you could balance Iran against our traditional allies and somehow there would be a more stable region. Well, of course, that did not happen. It produced disequilibrium because Iran took all the money they got from the Iran deal and they didn't use it to build you know, infrastructure for their citizens or treat them better. Um, they used it to finance their terrorist uh, supporting infrastructure throughout the Middle East. They grew more aggressive. And I fear that will happen again this time, except it'll happen on, on, on an even bigger scale. And of course, yes, they're actively targeting multiple former high level American officials on our soul, on our soil. And whether you're a Democrat or Republican, that should offend you. And that should tell you something very important about the nature of this regime. We got a minute, Congressman, for the benefit of the Steelers fans and everyone who's new to the show. There is a regime within the regime in Iran. It's the IRGC and it's the Quds Force. Can you tell people what that means? We can't deal with Iran because there are two Iran, there are three or four Irans, but the nastiest one, they're not at the table with us. Yeah, I mean, does, I mean this is an imperfect analogy, but, but think about it sort of like as a hybrid between a CIA-like entity and our special operations forces that goes all throughout the Middle East and indeed the world, empowering and training terrorist proxies, except they don't abide by the same rules that, of course, our military and our intelligence organizations uh, do. They have absolutely nothing in common and don't share our values. That's why I say it's an imperfect analogy, but it's sort of a quasi-intelligence paramilitary organization, and it is where a lot of the power resides in the regime. It's also, you can think of it as the action arm of 
the supreme leader. And ultimately, in that regime, power redounds to the supreme leader, you know, full stop right there. And so it's important to understand. That's why we need we need Ron Johnson to be reelected. We need Oz in Pennsylvania and Herschel in Georgia and O'Day in Colorado and Blake Masters in Arizona and whoever gets nominated in New Hampshire and Smiley in Washington. We got to put up a block on this. Congressman Mike Gallagher doing his job in the House. Thank you, Congressman. Sorry about what happens to you in Minnesota this week. We'll talk about that next week. Don't go anywhere. Higgins is going to be the new congresswoman who represents my daughter and her family in Virginia Beach in the Norfolk area. Jen Higgins, I met in Wyoming, in Wyoming at the uh, gathering a couple weeks back. Hello, Jen. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I am great. Let's get people to your website first. Where should they go to find out everything about Jen Higgins? Yes, www.jenforcongress, J-E-N-F-O-R, congress.com. Very easy. That's very easy. You need some money. It's going to Democrats are going to do everything they can and pretend that Elaine Luria is a conservative. She's not. That's right. She absolutely is not. She votes with Nancy Pelosi and Joe Biden's failed policies 99 percent of the time. But she won't tell you that right before an election. Uh, she plays a moderate on television. And this happens every time she runs. But she absolutely is not a moderate. So that'll be my job to educate the voters. And that's where all that fundraising comes in handy so we can get our message out there as well. Okay, Jen for congresscom Jen, tell us about your life story. People always want to know the back story. Yeah, so thanks for asking. I mean, I uh, I was Navy helicopter pilot. That was my my first job right out of college. I graduated the year that women could fly in combat. So I went to flight school and and thought that would be a, a great fit and served with uh, some of the greatest Americans for ten years. Deployed a couple times to the Persian Gulf. Did some humanitarian missions around the Kosovo. Uh, conflict. And it was just just a great time in my life. I met my husband, who's a F-18 pilot, uh, who served for 20 years as well. I'm the daughter of a Green Beret uh, from, who served in Vietnam. And now I have children in the military. So we have a big, big Navy family in this district. Uh, is big Navy. A lot of veterans here, a lot of military people here. But I got out of the Navy after 10 years and was able to be a stay-at-home mom. And I have four, four children uh, that I raised with my husband and was a Navy spouse while he finished his career. So, and then had a GI bill that was burning a hole in my pocket. So I went back to nursing school. My mo mother's a nurse, my brother's a nurse. And I just had grandparents that were very influential in my life, made a big impact. And I studied geriatrics. So I, I got my master's degree in nursing at Vanderbilt and have been practicing in long-term care, assisted living, memory care, uh, and most recently primary care. I've done some home health and hospice as well, but it's just been a great honor to participate in healthcare for our greatest generation. I truly love that job. It's a special group of people you know, that I've advocated for as there, government. There, there are not a lot of people who could not only attend to an accident victim, but fly them in the emergency medical helicopter to the hospital and then get them into the ER. You're one of them, Jen Kiggins. Let me ask you, though, uh, my daughter, who will be your constituent, military spouse, Navy spouse, she yeah. was very upset with Virginia Beach schools. I, I don't know any military spouse that did not understand what happened to the schools down there. Is that an issue? School boards are usually not an issue in congressional races, but I think Americans are still upset over the way the public schools reacted last three years. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we fought hard, you know, I'm the state senator from Virginia Beach as well. So we fought hard last year on the state level to give parents that option to be able to return to in-person learning. And, and with the mask mandates, we fought hard against those things, too. But, uh, you know, I think we saw here in Virginia last November that parents really wanted to say in their kids' education. If you remember back the Yunkin campaign and especially that debate he did with Terry McAuliffe where, uh, you know, Glenn Youngkin said, parents need that voice in their kids' education. And Terry McAuliffe said, no, they don't. And we see how that election turned out. So uh, parents will be on the ballot this year. Again, you know, parents matter. Parents want to say, I think we all saw firsthand during COVID what our kids were learning, some of the stresses they were going through and, and the challenges with our education system. So that was very eye-opening. It was eye-opening for me as a mom to four kids. I have two in college and two are still at home. So you know, all parents, we really want to know what our kids are learning. We want to make sure they're learning the right things, which this day and age, you know, that, that's a big question out there. So education will absolutely be on the ballot this year as well. Last question for you, Jen Kiggin. Jen for congresscom And you do need those $25, $50, $100 contributions. I want to talk to you about the student loan debacle. I am angry about that. I helped my kids through college. I paid off my student loans because my wife was working when I went to law school. We paid them off. I remember doing that last check. Uh, you mentioned the GI Bill. People earn that. They earn that by serving their country. What's your reaction and what's the reaction of the district to the bailout? That's right. Yeah, the veterans are not happy with this. A lot of us joined the military for the education benefit alone. I mean, I certainly did. I would not have gone to college without it. So it's a bit of a slap in the face to our veterans, in my opinion, that now 
taxpayers, including our veterans and our military, are going to be paying for other people's student loan debt. Uh, it's not fair. You know, if I have a debt for my car, for my house, you know, I'm expected to pay it off. This, this business where we step in and the government is going to use our hard-earned tax dollars to pay off other people's debt. A lot of people don't even choose to go to college because they can't afford it. And so they go out and they get hardworking trade jobs, you know, skilled jobs. You know, it's not fair to those guys. So now to have every single American taxpayer pay, pay off the debt of, uh, of other people, you know, this is just a ploy during election season to get uh, younger voters attracted to, uh, to the Democratic Party and what their agenda is. And it's not right. Uh, and it's something I'm very against and we'll make sure it uh, doesn't happen if I have any say in it. Jen Kagan's great to talk to you again. Jen for Congress dot com. Go there, support her. I hope we talk to you before the election again, Jen. Thank you for joining great me. To, great to see you. Take care. Good to see you. And thank you, Adam. And thank you, Generalissimo. And thank you, Jacob. And thanks to everyone who listened today, especially I've said it many, many times because I always want to make sure every new listener. News Talk 94.3 KYLS in Fredericktown, Missouri. I couldn't stump Rove. He knew all about you. I'm glad you're part of the Hugh Hewitt Show universe now. You can subscribe to the universe, by the way, and get Dwayne's After Show every day, every hour of every show I've ever done for 20 years on the Salem Radio Network, 23 to be exact, is all there at the universe. And I am glad you are listening today. I'll be back tomorrow with more on the next Hugh Hewitt Show.